All right, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Beyond COVID, the Notes Edition. I just thought of that. <laughs> she sounded okay. All righty. Uh, with this lecture, then Monday's lectures like this, turns out that I can't come back Monday. Monday's my return date, but they said they don't know what time of day that I marked ten uh, two weeks. So they said I just have to stay gone all day Monday. So, anyway, I just checked out the news. They said Trump is now a symbol of his own failure. That's, <laughs> that's awesome. Anyway, anyway, I'm not supposed to talk about politics. So, let us review. Oh, no, 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 no. We had a good thing going. We agreed, Charlie. Okay, let's see how far we can get without this panther uh, getting in our way. Um, well, she'll be a little entertainment. Okay, let's review a little bit of what we did last time. Uh, we are still... Practicing Dirac notation, and remember that a ket is a column vector or a one element matrix. Uh, so we call those vectors. Vectors are one element matrices. And uh, we have some basis set, and those are the A basis set. So these are the projections into, into that basis set. Um, this is a really great way to think about material science, by the way. Uh, dot 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 although those dots look terrible which bothers me uh, anyway let's see now we also went over a bra and again an alpha bra and uh, these are row vectors and now I always like to project a state into something else that means I like to have the state a ket in the um, the, the, the project into uh, something like a, a particle in a box state. Um, but now I've turned the bra into a ket, so that means that this is a complex conjugate. And uh, then we've got the, the second, uh, the first excited state, whatever that is. Um, complex conjugate, dot, dot, dot. Oh, those dots look nice. Anyway, okay. Uh, now, today, we're going to be doing a lot more with spin matrices, and we're building up our way to understanding the uncertainty principle. And uh, so we're going to be doing lots of spin up, spin down. We're going to come back to stern gerlach as well. And uh, let's see. I'm also going to explain where that SX operator came from that we talked about last time. Now, before I get to that, let's remind ourselves of uh, basic of, uh, kets of, uh, of the SZ basis set, spin up. Uh, to span state uh, space, we have to have a spin down uh, ket, and that's that matrix. Um, the SZ operator is in matrix form, uh, is 1, 0, 0, minus 1. Notice it's diagonal, and uh, remember that a, uh, an operator represented in its own basis has to be diagonal, so that's something we covered last time. Okay, SX. Now, we're going to actually prove this one today, but you, you had a little bit of a preview last lecture. Um, but as I mentioned to you, today I'm going to actually derive this thing. Uh, let's see, we had also done some uh, practice. Let's see, we took uh, the SZ polarized state plus polarized. We ran it through the stern gerlach and then we asked for the projection onto the minus state. And again, I'm just, we're just doing some practice. This is the SZ uh, minus uh, bra. Here's the operator, which of course, I'm going to leave out the H bar over twos, okay? It's just, you know, so you can always take your end result and multiply it by H bar over two. Okay, the bra is a row, the ket is a column. Okay, and again, the only thing I'm a little worried about it, you folks, whether you remember what to do, it's, um, Zero, uh, okay, so uh, a matrix times a column is another column, or an uh, operator times a ket is another ket. Those are the same thing. Zero uh, times one plus one times zero. One times one plus zero times zero. Okay, then a row times a column is a number, is a scalar technically, zero, zero, one, one. Okay, so it's one. Or h bar over two if I didn't drop the h bar over two, just for convenience sake. Okay, now again, 
Today, we're actually going to derive this. I just, uh, I just gave this to you just so we could do some practice. It's all about, we're still in the middle of learning Dirac notation. We're still learning how to work with Dirac notation. But we're going to stop that today. We're going to start working on, excuse me, um, and we're going to start we're, um, building up towards the uncertainty principle. Okay, now, how do I know what, what, what this is? How, how do I know that? Okay, first thing, let's build the state. No, I know I've done this before, um, but let's, we're going to do everything with stern gerlach experiments. So we're going to design the Dirac notation. I mean, it's been designed for us, but so what I'm going to show you is how Dirac notation works such that it uh, is able to predict stern gerlach experiments correctly. So I've got an SX polarized state, which I've prepared by another stern gerlach uh, device. Um, so I've picked off the plus state, and now I'm going through the Z state. And I think it's intuitive. If not, we've covered it. Uh, that if I have uh, if I have the silver atoms electron polarized in the in you know this way, uh, when I measure how much what's what how much are the electrons pointed up or down, uh, it's it's 50-50 here. Right? When I look 90 degrees, and what that means is uh, therefore, um, remember all observables all observables are uh, absolute values, right? Uh, 0 0.5. So the probability of being up or down in the z direction. Um, now, of course, I'm uh, the ket is sx plus because I've defined it to be x s x s x plus because I created uh, the polarization that way. Okay, so so this is definitely true. Okay. So now let me rewrite that, but I'm gonna uh, I'm not gonna do the I'm gonna take the square root because it's just a little bit easier uh, to deal with. Um, is equal to minus, and that's one over the square root of two. Okay, I just took the square root. All right. Now this next part is a little funky, and I'll, I'll I'll explain best I can, but I have to admit I don't know that I necessarily understand it myself. Okay. So what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to create the SX uh, state and I'm going to describe it in the SZ basis. So um, now I've, I've written this down before, but uh, again, I was previewing. Today I'm going to prove it. So I've got to have a component in the plus state. There's got to be a square root of 2 somewhere. Okay, this next part is going to be like, what? And I will do my best to explain it. But this is called a phase factor e to the i sigma, and I'll call that sigma 1 for x. Uh, you'll have a sigma 2 for y. We'll, we'll deal with that in a second. Okay. Uh, s, x minus, yeah, I'm going to write down the same thing, uh, plus, except that, of course, is the minus state, so we're going to have a minus there. This thing, and again, is called a phase factor. Whenever you see e to the i something, it's called a phase factor. That is just the word for it. So don't take any more meaning other than that's just the word for it. Ooh, I got to sorry, I got to look at the camera. Um, all right, what the heck does this mean? What I am trying to express here is that I don't really know. I you know I want to write down one over the square root of two of plus plus minus, one over the square root of two of plus minus minus. That's what I want to do. The thing is, I don't know that. I don't really know that it's that. Uh, it turns out that uh, let's see here, all of my experimental observations are described with this. With Again, this is called a phase factor. I don't know what sigma 1 is. So the point here is that I don't, I can't say I know more than I do. I can't say that sx plus is plus plus minus and that sx minus is plus minus minus. I can't say that because I can have this, I can throw in an unknown, an, an unknown factor and still reproduce the experiment and if that's the case, I, I need to leave that unknown factor in because I don't know. And quantum is all about probability and statistics, and so you can't say that you know more than you do. Okay, and it, this gets a little nasty, but let me prove that. Um, if I project uh, to the minus state, um, and let's take the absolute value, uh, what, what do I get? Um, uh, let's see here. So what I get is absolute value. I've got 1 over the square root of 2 uh, minus plus. So I'm looking here. Uh, then I've got 
e to the i theta 1 over square root of 2 uh, minus minus, which is 1. Um, sorry, I do that a lot with bras and gets. Okay, uh, let's square it, the absolute value. So this ends up being, uh, okay, well that's 0. So this ends up being 1 over the square root of 2 e to the um, minus, uh, minus i sigma uh, times e to, I, I, I shouldn't have written that one, now I'm committed. Okay, complex conjugate, um, complex conjugate times the whatever, and that's one half. Okay, so my point being here that uh, I, I've already talked about how, uh, well, right there, right there, half, half, right, so with this phase factor deal, I am getting the right results. I don't know what sigma 1 is, and so therefore I, I'm, I'm kind of obliged to do it this way. All right, now let me tell you a little bit more about what is a phase factor for real. Okay, so let's, a phase factor is always just a number of this form. All right, so that's a phase factor. Now it gets its name from, let's operate on a wave, right? And this is all wave mechanics. Remember this, remember this expression? What is that? This is e to the i, remember that these things add together. So kx plus uh, angular frequency times time. Oops, 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 oops sorry, sorry, sorry. Plus, <laughs> I messed up. Oh, I wish I had some white out. All right, anyway. So you see what you've done is you've just added a, a, a little offset. So what that means is, uh, and we call it a phase, uh, because here I'll draw a little, what is that, a sign? Yeah, it's a sign. Okay, I'm drawing a little sign function. And the angle, let's say that the angle is here. Okay, what happens is when you multiply it by a phase factor, let's say that you do pi over halves, um, all you do is you just shift your wave over. Uh, to the right if it's positive, to the left if, if it's negative. So again, if my wave was at this, this, the top of the hill here, a multiplication by a phase factor simply shifts the wave over left or right. Just, it just simply adds in a little, little extra angle. And angles are often called phase, so phase factor. So that's all it is. Now, what the phenomenological meaning behind writing this is to say that, um, for one, I've tried to convince you that I, I don't necessarily know as much as I do. The other thing is to say that you don't know the relative phases between the states. Um, now, since it's a relative phase, I can always say that this angle, this phase factor, is e to the i0, which is 1 and that this is a different phase relative to that. So this can be 1, and sigma 1 is the difference such that, um, such that this is how it is. So if, if the phase between the plus and minus states is unknown, I can always say that I can lump the difference enti ent entirely into one factor. So that's another phenomenological reason why this is okay. I, I can't really say I understand it better than that. And I've, I've always been a little confused myself by phase factors. Another thing is phase factors don't do anything, right? Because the absolute value of e to the i, uh, right, that's, that's one. So phase factors actually don't even do anything. They are pretty confusing. Uh, anyway, okay, so there's that. Okay, so what? All right, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to start. I'm going to I'm going to create the SX operator, and and to do that, uh, let me remind you that um, is sorry. Let me find my notes. Uh, let's let's take an A operator operating on its uh, basis function. Okay, you're sick of that. Uh, therefore, you know the A operator in um, uh, one of the one of the many ways to represent this is to. Uh, take a sum of all states of eigenvalues uh, times the outer product. Okay, so we're going to take this, and A will now be SX, so let's write that. Okay, so SX, SX is going to be, um, okay, for uh, SX plus, its eigenvalue is h bar over 2, uh, so outer product of SX, SX, uh, minus H bar over 2, and then, of course, the only other, you know, this is a sum of states. Uh, there's, there's only an up and a down state, right? So, so this is really easy. 
Now the problem is, is that now I've got to convert this into the Z basis. And, and to do that, I'm going to use that description I used before, which unfortunately is on a previous page. But anyway, okay, what does that look like? Okay, this is, this is a mouthful, okay? H bar over 2. Okay, H bar over 2 is common to everything. So I've got, okay, I've got a ket. So that's plus uh, over the square root of 2. Um, plus e to the i phase factor 1. Uh, there's a sigma 2 for the y uh, basis set. You'll see that in a minute. Okay, so there's that. Okay, that is the ket. Here's the bra. Plus square root of 2. Uh, okay, a bra is going to have a complex conjugate in front of it. So minus i sigma 1. Sigma 1 for x, sigma 2 for y. Okay, now let's subtract the um, h bar is still out here. Okay, let's subtract the. Oh, I know I'm going to run out of room. I do this all the time. I'm going to go ahead and write really small because I know I'm going to run out of room. Okay, the s minus s x minus. So I get a minus there, but that phase factor is still positive. Square root of two. Uh, that is a ket. Let's do the bra plus. Square root of 2. I don't know why I do this to myself every time. Okay, the bra has a negative phase factor. And then in bracket. There we go. Um, the God, why do I do that every time? Anyway, I hope you can see that. Sorry about that. All right, now what you do... <clears throat> is foil, 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 foil. It looks like you got two foils. And what you're going to find is once you've done some algebra, um, it's not too bad. It's not as clean. I bet you thought this is going to be real clean. That all those uh, e to the i sigma deals, I bet you thought they were going to go away. And you get plus, plus, and minus, minus. Well, you're not. Uh, you can't get plus, plus, and minus, minus. You cannot get that um, because that would be SX. That's Z, S Z, sorry. Okay, so so I'm not too surprised we got my uh, plus minus and minus plus. Okay. So again, there's a lot of foiling going on here, a lot of um, yeah, yeah, there's some elimination of terms. And you get a result. Um, it's relatively compact, but it's not maybe as quite as clean as you thought. It is what it is. Now, I should probably assign this for homework. I'm thinking about doing that. I may write an extra homework assignment. You haven't had enough homework, so don't get too mad at me if I do that. But I think maybe you should work through some of this. Like, uh, let, let's do SY, and probably not too hard to predict what I'm going to write here. Uh, square root of 2 plus. Now, here's the other phase factor. It'll still be plus, but it's going to be a sigma 2. Square root of 2 is freaking everywhere. Okay, and then SY minus. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to project, I'm going to project SX plus into SY plus. Uh, that's how we're going to solve this. So the, mi the SY minus has a minus sign out here, but the phase factor is still plus. Um, you get minus phase factors when you have complex conjugates, right? Uh, okay, so there's that. Um, now when you figure out the operator, the operator, again, it, it, it does take a bit of effort, right? Um, but it's not it's not obscene either. Um, and I gotta look at my notes. Okay, h bar over two. E to the minus i sigma two um, plus minus plus e to the i sigma over two minus plus. Again, they're outer products because outer products are operators. Okay, so so what? Well, based on our last term, Gerlach Dealey, um, we've got to. So what we're going to do now is we're going to figure out sigma one and sigma two, and we're going to do that by Stern Gerlach. And Stern Gerlach says that if I uh, take the SX polarized in the plus state and I look and I run it through another Stern Gerlach to look at SY. Um, that that's no different, you know, what's up and down is, is not meaningful to nature. Uh, so the plus and the minus are, are identical. So there you go. Um, okay, 
Now, this express these two expressions, uh, so I've got two expressions and I've got two unknowns, sigma 1 and sigma 2. Sigma 1 for x, sigma 2 for y. Two expressions, um, they have, they're equal to finite values, so I can figure out what they are. I'm just going to do one of them, and that's going to allow me to calculate the difference between sigma 1 and sigma 2, and that's actually good enough. Um, and, and it's just, it's good enough. You'll, you'll see in a minute. Okay, I'm going to do this one. I'm going to do this one. All right, and I will not do the square, at least not at first. I'm going to um, I'll make it a square root. Okay, let's see. Now, now you have to... Okay, so this is this is this guy here, and I got a bra. So let's see here. I've got 1 over the square root of 2. 1 over the square root of 2. Okay, a bra plus plus e to the minus i minus because it's a bra uh, sigma two because it is the um, because it is the y state. Okay, so there's the bra. Now let's do the ket one over the square root of two. Let's do the ket the sx plus ket, which is plus. Uh, because it is a ket, I uh, sigma one, sigma one because it's x, plus because it's sx plus, uh, e to the i not minus i because it is a ket not a bra, and that is the minus state. Uh, and that okay, uh, absolute value, and I am just uh, I'm taking the square root of both sides. Okay, so there we go. Now what? Now I know this. Um, uh, uh, right, it looks a little, it looks a little nasty, and it, maybe it is. Okay, just how, if I just get started, I'm going to do okay. One over one, one times, one over the square root of two times one over the square root of two is one over one half. All right, that wasn't too bad. Okay, next bit. I got myself a foil going on here. Foils are learned in middle school, except Dirac notation foils are actually really easy. Plus plus, that's one. Okay. Plus minus, doesn't matter what that is, um, plus minus, that's zero. Minus plus zero, that's actually relatively easy. Plus e to the i, uh, sigma one minus sigma two, um, absolute value is equal to one over the square root of two. Okay, so there we go. Now you see I have an expression and let's just treat I have an unknown, which is this difference, so I'm going to solve for the difference. And, and clearly, I can solve for the difference, right? I have, I have kind of. If I if I treat this difference like a thing, I'm only I only don't know that thing, and everything else is all defined, right? I know what a half is. I know what one of square root of two is. In fact, I know that all of this actually has to be square root of two. Uh, square root of two over two is one of the square root of two. Okay, so now I'm almost there. I know that, I'll write that down again, I'm out of the room. Okay, uh, to make this work, to make the stern girl like experiment work, so I can figure out what, um, uh, bah, 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 where am I at? One plus e to the i sigma one minus sigma two is equal to the square root of uh, two. Okay, now I just gotta solve that. Okay, now tell you what. You know, I could do that with Mathematica pretty quick. Maybe MATLAB, I don't know. Mathematica I'd like better for this stuff. However, why don't we learn a little bit more complex mathematics, right? Let's take some time because complex mathematics is a really good thing to know. Let's figure out how to add two complex numbers, A1 plus IB1. Let's add two numbers, right? Because these are both complex numbers. This is just a very, this is a complex number without a complex component. This is definitely a complex number. How do I add them together? Okay, A plus IB plus A2 plus IB. All complex numbers are of the form A plus IB. Okay, so what I got to do is I got to get them in the form of A plus IB1 uh, plus A2 plus IB2 is equal to, here's the real component. And here's the imaginary component. It's, it's stupid, right? Okay, so that's what we got to do with these two numbers here. But you may notice that one of these deals is in the polar form, right? So it turns out that A plus IB is often represented as in this form. That's the polar form, where R, of course, is A squared plus B squared, square root. And the angle, the angle is like arctan of B over A, something like that. I, I don't quite remember, but um, it's often represented, uh, there's the real plane, here's the complex plane, 
Uh, you've got a vector with the length r. Uh, it makes an angle theta with respect to the um, real axis. Okay, now the reason that we like this guy here is because the absolute uh, value is um, absolute value squared is just r squared, right? Uh, because the phase factor, right, never does anything. Uh, the absolute value is this times its complex conjugate, which is 1. So this is why we like to put things in the polar form. Okay, now, back to task. This, uh, now we got what we got to do is we got to get this in the, not in the A plus IB form, but, but it already is, uh, but this guy is in the polar form, so we have to convert this back into the um, A plus IB form, and then, then we do this right here. All right, how do we do that? Okay, and now for 1, all right, the number 1, Right, the number 1 is 1 times e to the i0. Okay, so that handles this guy. Okay, what about e to the i sigma 1 minus sigma 2? How do we deal with that? Okay, for 1, notice that r is 1, right? That's the number in front of it, and this is all angled. All right, now, uh, if you look here and do some geometry, what you figure out is, is that this is r, uh, the, the real component is r cos of the angle, uh, but r is 1, so that's cos sigma 1 minus sigma 2. That's the real component. And the imaginary component is i times r, which is 1 sine sigma 1 minus sigma 2. Okay, there you go. All right, so therefore, 1 plus e to the i sigma 1 minus sigma 2 is equal to, well, no, let me think here, okay, 1 plus cos, uh, the difference between these two, and plus i sine difference, sigma 1 minus sigma 2, and uh, tell you what, let's, um, um, see, this is the real and that's the imaginary. Okay, so what do I want to do here? I want to, um, I want to take the absolute value, absolute value, and set that equal to the square root of 2. Okay, um, I, yeah, I should have put that up here, absolute value, right? Okay, now, the absolute value is going to be the square root of, um, mm, Square root, you know, why don't I just square the damn thing? I just square the damn thing, yeah. Okay, so this is going to be the real part squared. That's 1, um, 1. Uh, th this, this is the real part, so I square it by itself. 1 plus cos sigma 1 minus sigma 2. Um, 1 plus, oh, damn it, 1 plus 2 plus cos sigma 1 minus sigma 2. I'm kind of doing this in my head. I, in honesty, I've already worked it out. Sorry, I, I know it's a little bit... Um, I, I, I kind of squished it a bit. Okay, um, then the imaginary part squared. So a squared plus b squared. Um, so b squared is sine squared sigma 1 minus sigma 2. Um, You know, this is this is like um, it's a reminder what we're doing. This is like a squared. This is like b squared, and of course the whole thing is equal to uh, square root of two squared two. Okay, now now uh oh, <coughs> look at that. Look at that. Look at that. Cosine squared plus sine squared. Right. So this ends up being kind of easy. Okay, so two is equal to one plus two cos difference in angle plus 1. Uh, 2 is equal to 2 plus, that better be 0, better be equal to 0, therefore, where is cos, where is cos 0? At pi halves. See that? Right, you see, 2 is better, better equal to 2, so it better have cos, the argument of cos better be 0, and that's at pi halves. So, the difference between those angles is pi halves. So now, um, to get them, to get an absolute value, by the way, what you really need to do is do this problem. Maybe I'll put that on your homework. 
to do that one, you just repeat all this except for SY minus. Regardless, what you can do is set this one equal, uh, equal to uh, zero. And then what you'll do is take the Y uh, phase factor and set that equal to pi halves. And then what you have is SX plus is equal to 1 over the square root of 2 plus 1 over the square root of 2 minus. Uh, e to the i0 is 1, so that's the phase factor deal is gone when it comes to Sx. Um, and Sx minus is 1 over the square root of 2 plus minus 1 over the square root of 2 minus. Okay. Yeah, let's all, uh, get this uh, get the paper. Okay, SY plus is 1 over the square root of 2 plus. And its phase factor ends up being uh, e, to the, uh, e to the i pi halves is i. Uh, you can actually just Google that. Uh, you can actually draw that little um, that little diagram of the polar representation of complex numbers, and you can figure it out that way. Um, minus i square root of two. Phase factor is the same, so they're both i. That minus sign is just from s y and the minus minus polariz down polarization. All right, so there you go. All right. Next bit, that means that uh, Sx, now remember we've already talked about Sx is h bar over 2. Um, minus Sx minus Sx minus, and basically the same thing for Sy. Uh, now do a bunch of algebra on that, and what you find is h bar over 2. Again, put this in the basis now that we've defined Sx and S Sy plus minus plus minus. Now, yeah, right, remember, we, uh, define the phase factors. Uh, let's put this in, in a matrix form, 0, 1, 1, 0. Okay, now let's do Sy. And again, we've already written this out. This is minus i. Again, not quite. You want you want the other term to be minus, don't you? You want that to be you want that to be here, but it's not. Plus i minus plus. A bit of a mouthful. Okay, and that's h bar over two. It's like x except that it's got a bunch of i's and some minus i's. Okay, so that's off diagonal. Okay. Just so you know, these are called uh, spin matrices, uh, poly spin matrices. So those are often called SX. It's also called S1. This is called uh, sigma Y. It's often referred to as sigma 2, with, of course, SZ uh, being, as, as we've gone over a zillion times, uh, 0, uh, bar over 2, 1, 0, 0, minus 1, um, without the h bar over, uh, sorry, that's that's the z guy, and that's often called sigma three. Um, the, the 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 poly deal doesn't have h bar over two in it. It's anyway, it's more of a math thing. Um, so there you go. Uh, what we've done so far is we have just want to summarize. We have practiced most <laughs> most of what we just did was practice. That was really the goal. Uh, practice hard though. These were really some of the harder things we could do with this stuff. Uh, we've got everything worked out. Everything has been worked out in terms of spin up and spin down. And last bit, I want to intro. I want to intro uncertainty principle. So we're going to do everything you can do with the uncertainty principle using spin matrices because that's the easiest way you can fully explore it. Okay, here's what I want to do. I want us to think about sequential operators. Okay, why? Because I can measure. Sy and then measure Sx concurrently without any um, separate, without any little beam blocks or anything funky like that. Okay, so they each have an h bar over two. So now I've got an h bar uh, squared over four. Okay, Sx is plus minus plus minus 
plus. Okay. Then um, um, uh, I don't know if I'm <laughs> no, I'm freaking out because I don't know if I'm bracketing it correctly. Okay. Uh, minus i plus minus plus i minus plus. Okay, um, now do some uh, simplification. Uh, h bar, h bar squared over four. Um, that is going to be i plus plus minus i minus minus. Okay, so again. Uh, you've got to foil this out, and, and I think you've you've seen enough to be able to do that. So maybe I'll have you do that on a homework. So anyway, okay. Now what I want to do is I want to I'm going to flip this. I'm going to see what happens if I had done the measurement in the opposite order, and it turns out that this would be um, equal to h bar um, h bar squared over four um, minus i plus plus, plus i, minus, minus. Okay. Okay, now, you can imagine that if I want to know if it matters whether an operator uh, is sequential, you know, does, does, it, does it matter if I take some silver atoms and measure sy and then sx, or sx and xy? What I could do is subtract, let's call that 1, let's call that 2. Let's take 1 minus 2. Let's see, what do you get? Okay, what you get is h bar squared over 4. Get 2. Um, so that minus that is actually, so uh, that minus is plus, so 2i plus, plus, uh, minus, 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 2i, minus, minus. Uh, so what that is, is actually i, h bar, that is actually the uh, sz operator, right? Uh, because sz is um, h bar over, over 2, um, plus, plus, minus, 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 minus. Anyway, so you multiply this thing times i h bar. There's your i's, and you got an h bar squared. So, so hopefully you see that um, s x y minus s y x is actually s z times i h bar. Okay. So it turns out that that is called a commutation, uh, taking the difference. Uh, let, let me let me be very generic. A B. The commutator of A and B is uh, A B. You, you you do got to get the order right, by the way. Okay, that's called a commutator, and it turns out for if you do these uh, this S X S Y. If you do it over and over again, you're going to find the following, that uh, you're going to have i h bar, okay, this thing here, let me explain what this is. Okay, so what the heck is that? What is, uh, it's, called a, it's called a cyclic permuter, something like that. Um, okay, it's equal to 1 if i, j, k go like x, y, z. Uh, that includes y, z, x, um, z, x, y. Okay, so that, that's cyclic. Okay, it's equal to minus 1 if you've got, it, it, you know, if it goes the other way. So that's uh, z, y, x, um, and that's, that's, of course, anti-cyclic. Right. And it's equal to 0 if i is equal to j. Okay, so uh, therefore sy, sx um, is equal, let's see, sy, xz, that would be anti-cyclic, so that would be minus i h bar um, 
S Z. K K because you know if I got I J K uh, Y X uh, Z uh, Z is the only other thing it can be. Uh, since since this was not X Y, if this was X Y, that would be cyclic, right? And that would be I H bar S Z. Uh, here I, I went in reverse, right? So so X Y Z. So uh, here I went X Y Z. So that's cyclic, and here I went. Y, Z, then I backtracked over to Z, so that's anti-cyclic, so that's how that works. Okay, then there's this other thing, uh, which is called an anti-commutator. Oh, Jesus. Commutator. Then I got this other thing. Where am I at? Um, A, B, this is part of your one of your homework questions, by the way. A, B, this is an anti-commutator. You just add them. So that's anti-commutator. You need to know about this when you answer questions about the uncertainty principle. Okay, and so there's not much to that. Uh, what you find is for our spin operators, S, I, S, J, is h bar squared over 2 uh, Kronecker delta i j okay so that is 0 if i is equal to if i is not equal to j uh, equal to 1 if i is equal to j maybe I'll have you do that on a homework okay now commutators are super famous deals in quantum mechanics anti-commutators are almost never heard of but you need to prove the uncertainty principle using anti-commutators and so that's going to come up okay okay next time uh the uncertainty principle we are going to prove the uncertainty principle for the spin case and if it works in that it really works for everything i think this may have been a little bit long sorry about that uh, one more lecture like this and we're done and i will see you all on wednesday